Sarah Thauer. Welcome to the Happy Musicians Podcast. Yay, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, this is a huge treat. I think you're incredible. And I'm off the bat just wondering, I mean, we just kind of hit the one year mark in the pandemic. And I'd love to hear what your takeaways from this experience have been, kind of what how you've grown through it and things you're trying to some positive takeaways coming out of this. Yeah. So um, before March, it was really just go, go, go tour gigs, flying here and there. And um, coming back to Toronto gave me a chance to kind of stop and think, what am I doing? Am I just like taking gigs for the sake of it? What is like my end goal? And it just got me thinking a lot. I started meditating a lot, um, changed my diet and started writing a lot of different music, really practicing and listening to a bunch of music that maybe I never got a chance to get to. So I feel like a lot of self um, improvement and indulging inward, I, I would say that that's been the biggest thing that I've tried to take away from this. And then knowing that eventually the world will open up and I don't want to continue the same way that I was before because it was too automatic rather than really going towards a direction of what I want. So I think for me, it's just been beneficial beneficial in terms of like working inwardly. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, yeah. what like what do you want more of going forward? What is your kind of new vision for what you want your yeah. life to look like? Oh, by the way, if you hear any noise, it's just my cat like hanging around and scratching Amazing. surfaces. And so I'll just <laughs> say that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so in terms of like vision changing I guess for me my goal before was like to play with everybody and that's still my goal I have a big list of musicians that I aspire to play with one day but I also was like what about me like what does Sarah want to do and I felt like I was just like writing music that had lead sheets and hiring people to play or just writing music just because I had to but now I feel like I'm tapping into myself like I love, I love comedy. Like I love being very personable. I love like mainstream media, but I'm a drum geek and I'm a music geek at heart too. So mm -hmm. what I want to do in terms of my artistry is combine both of the worlds, kind of like make music and refer to myself as an artist and tap into kind of like mainstream media, uh, personable comedy, fun stuff, but with like music virtuosity ish. So that's the kind of music and headspace that I'm working toward right now yeah that's exciting yeah when you say yeah. that you have like a list of musicians that you want to play with i'm curious how much like manifestation or thinking things into existence how much into that that you get well i feel like before i never consciously understood that that world but then I started to see it happen. Like, for example, mm. I wrote down, like right after university, I wrote down a whole list of people that I want to work with. And like I had John Baptiste's name and I played with John Baptiste like twice in the last, whatever, two years and a bunch of other people. And another one is like Walter Smith the mm third. -hmm. And then, and then like, like I just played like one minute on his like the little clip on Instagram, but for me, right. that was huge. Like, you know uh. what I mean? <laughs> so, and like, so yeah, I feel like it's been working for me, but um, I guess I'm not thinking about it that like I'm trying to manifest these things. For me, it's just like, I'm just gonna keep practicing and mm -hmm. trying to post more, trying to show up more at different places and be the best version that I can be and then leave it to the to the universe that whatever is meant to happen for me will happen and whatever will come my way will come my way and I'll just do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sweet. So it's, I don't want to say passive in like a negative way, but you, you set that intention clearly and yeah. then you're like, all right, all I can do now is just work on myself. Yeah. I kind of just like let it go and because it's, it is out of your control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's been one thing that has been painfully obvious during all this is like what can I control and what can't I control over the last year yeah yeah a lot of reckoning with that question for sure yeah uh the and the biggest part for me about this experience has been like taking the nuclear option that a lot of musicians my age I know had to which was moving back in with our parents uh because all the music shuts down you know for sure and 
I say nuclear option because there is that worry and you especially hear it from your parents a lot of like music is hard and it's a difficult career and what if it doesn't work out like do you have a backup plan are you sure you want to do this and I know you've talked about how you you got that kind of pushback from your parents even with your dad who's like a professional musician and the thing I struggle with is like I have a hard time talking about my career with my parents because they're going to try to push it in a direction because they care about me and they don't want to see me get hurt. But I don't know how to not get in an argument like with my mom when she says, why don't you have a singer in your band? You know, that it's, I have so little self-control in that area. And I'm curious if you've found any strategies for talking about your career with your parents without it turning into (laughs) a big fight. I go through this like, every single day since the pandemic hit since I'm home my mom is like she's giving me career options I'm like and I told her I'm like mom I love you and I don't want to argue with you so if if you want to give me advice and if I tell you please mom please respect me and I I prefer not to talk about it right now and now she's like okay we won't talk about it so it's like I just say I don't agree with you I don't disagree with you but let's just like not talk about it please and then that's Mm -hmm. it Yeah. yeah I like that. I, that's kind of been my approach to it's yeah. and I it's like I have mentors and people who I like seek out to tell me those things. Yeah. And so I'm covered like I don't I don't need you to fill that role. Oh, exactly. Uh, it's, yeah, it's tough. It is tough. <laughs> yeah. I I I mean You've talked before about how you're a bit of a self-taught drummer. I mean, you you took formal lessons on other instruments, but not on drums. And I imagine once you got to university and then you started taking more formal lessons that, what was that change in mindset like from being like, I'm self-taught to then yeah. being a studied drummer? Totally. So growing up for me, I grew up in a time where we had like tapes and like cassettes and things like that, but there was no YouTube. And I think internet was like just getting into the world, I think. So whatever exposure I had to music and to albums was what my dad would bring in. And the thing that my dad would bring in was Indian music and it'd be Bollywood music. And our basement was filled with tabla, dholak, like a bunch of Indian percussion, a couple of drum kits and keyboards. And what we would do is that we would just listen to this music this Indian music and we would just jam all day long because my Mm. dad also came from a self-taught background. Like he was a band leader of his own band for over 20 years and he'd be um, the MD for artists that would come from India. And and his whole approach was just listening and just like figuring out and just playing it and about the feel of the music. So that was kind of my approach, but I love the drum kit so much more than the percussion. So what I would do is I would spend like four hours listening to records, playing them on tabla, playing them on all the percussion, and then hopping on the drum kit and being like, oh, what does the bass of the tabla sound like on a drum kit? Okay, it could be the kick drum. Um, mm-hmm. Let me use the rim to imitate the pinky of a tolak. Like, uh, tolak players were a pinky, so you hear, so I would put that on the rim. So mm-hmm. I never listened to Buddy Rich growing up. I never listened to Dave Weckl or not much Tony Williams growing up. Like, I listened to jazz, but I never really was like paradiddles or like, four-way coordination you know it was more of just sounds and so then going into university like I got rejected from all the schools that I applied for except for one school because they were telling me play me like a six eight uh, Cuban thing I could do it if you sung me the pattern I could figure it out but if I didn't Mm -hmm. know like the words and the definitions of that so for for me getting into university I went to York University and I, I got a full scholarship the Oscar Peterson scholarship and there what I loved about it is that they didn't make me something that I didn't want to be. They gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do, but to learn the terminology of what I was missing. So I started picking up stick control. I started picking up syncopation and I brushed up of all the terminologies and my technique. And I feel like that's when I got into fusion. That's when I was first exposed to gospel music and my world just changed after that. And I felt like I was literally reborn again. So when I talk to people, I'm like, I feel like I've literally lived two lives. If you go on my YouTube channel and if you scroll back to 2019 or 18, you'll see like a bunch of videos of me playing like 10 different percussion instruments to like pop songs for fun. And now it's like really drum geeky, jazz heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's just like two lives that I feel like I've lived in musically. Yeah. Well, and I think 
it's so inspiring because especially lately I've been interacting with a lot of musicians who are in the self-taught like identity mode and I there's so much pushback when you try to like share oh that thing you're talking about has like a codified name and it's really easy for us to communicate if we use that yeah and there's all this pushback that like if you study music from an academic standpoint you lose the magic just like inherently and I think mm -hmm. that creates this divide between self-taught musicians like a resentment between self-taught and learning these things and then vice versa between musicians who do learn these things it's like well you don't know the name so you're obviously not a good musician and yeah. I, I there's like this huge divide I feel like in the music community about that thing and were you ever worried that studying it from an academic standpoint would make you lose some of the magic? Uh, I wasn't worried about it because I wasn't even, con I didn't even know about this divide thing back then. Mm -hmm. I was just so caught up in trying to prove all these schools that I'm good enough and that I'll catch up to like this academia part of drumming that I didn't even care. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah. But I know that I remember like when I was like 17, 18 years old and when I would play, I wasn't even thinking and it was like the best time of my life. I didn't care what people thought. I wasn't worried about what's stickings, what's fancy, what's not fancy. And then while I was studying, I'm like, is this fancy enough? Is this good enough? Is this bad enough? And I never had any of these concerns before. So I hmm. did notice like, wow, now I have to like work on like my brain being on fire now rather than before <laughs> just like just letting loose and not caring. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that, so that does happen. That's totally a thing. Once yeah. you start learning about it and you learn how to analyze it, hopefully you can use yeah. that tool to get better, but it can also be yeah. self paralyzing. And yeah. how do you approach it? Because you're obviously like super into the, the geek thing now and going all the way and really love it. And how yeah. have you figured out a way to do it in a healthy way where you aren't, your brain isn't on fire, you know? Yeah. So for me, um, I like to study, um, musicians and drummers rather than like, let me learn this new lick or let me, you know, learn this like five over four thing or, or something like that. And I don't really go through books too much. I'll take a book and I'll find out why am I getting this book and I'll make my own systems out of it based on the music that I'm listening to. Mm -hmm. So that's my way of not getting too heady. And I listen to music as much as I practice. I feel like if there's a day if I'm practicing too much and I don't listen to enough music, I get too heady. So I'll have to like mm -hmm. take a break from the drums and just listen or even just like some take some time to just like improvise. And that helps me. So yeah. it sounds like all these, you're looking at the big picture, like who is this person that I'm studying and what does their music yeah. mean? And what is this, I, this technique is really cool. And to learn it, I need to like study it and figure out what it is, but what is the actual yeah. sound and how does it serve the music in a bigger picture? Yeah. And what does it make you feel like mm -hmm. a lot of like Indian grooves, for example, um, there's a groove called the Kerwa and the Kerwa is like the Indian backbeat. And I talk about this a lot where in North America, you have the snare on the two and the four. And in this genre of music, you have the snare on the uh of every 16th note. And I didn't, like, I've been playing it for over, like, for a billion years, but until someone asked me, hey, what is the Kerwa? I'm like, okay, one knee and, uh, I'm like, oh, it's on the uh. But before I was like, so every time I learn something, instead of going, thinking one knee and the two, yeah, for me, it's like, oh, okay, it's in my body. Okay, maybe now I can, like, think about it and figure out what it is. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. And I think that's the perfect example of how to live in both worlds and get yeah. the both best out of both of them. And I really think that to be growing and be a really happy, healthy musician, it's usually best obtained by doing both things, feeling it and being open to it, but also understanding what it is. So you aren't afraid of it. Exactly. I don't, I want to be in control of understanding whatever I can under my control like I never want to be like I don't know what that is so for mm -hmm. me it's like I think it's so important to uncover as much as like academia that you can all the all the drum nerd stuff and all the feeling stuff as much as you can so you're never in a position of I can't do this gig because I just don't know 
you, yeah. you know what I mean? So that's yeah, that's sure. been my kind of motivation to uncover both of the worlds, I would say. Makes a lot of sense. And yeah. honestly, a lot of times when you hear something that you don't understand, that's so exciting because it's something that you learn. But sometimes I feel like, and this has been me with harmony for the longest time, I just had convinced myself that I can't hear it. And part of me explained it as like, oh, this is just so cool and beyond me. But really when I actually sat down and examined it, like it was fear. I was afraid that, I was afraid of it because I didn't think I could yeah. understand it. And so I didn't experience it fully and get to like have that moment with the beauty. And I, I really think that most of the time when we don't, we're, we're not willing to learn about something because we think it'll be less special is because we're afraid that we can't understand it. And I don't think that's ever true. Like no part of learning music has made me feel like I can't learn more of it. Totally. I feel like we are capable to do whatever we want to do. We are capable to capable to understand whatever we want to. Like Steve Jobs has this quote, like once you realize that you have everything that you, you need to do whatever you want to do, like you're unstoppable. So like that quote, I've taken it and I've ran with it. And a lot of things that have been unreachable to me, I will like climb 10 ladders until I understand it. But because I know it's possible, there's, it, it just depends on how bad that you, how badly do you want to know it or how badly do you want to learn it? Yeah. And um, even to go a little deeper, I was talking about this the other day on like a live stream. Um, I love trying to tap into so many genres of music and so many different types of people from around the world. And it's very easy in today's world to be like, I like this, I don't like this, this sucks, this is the best, and now it's opinions, opinions, and opinions. And I feel like to learn anything to its fullest potential is to not have any sort of judgment. It's to kind of just mm. look objectively and hear so many perspectives. Because as a drummer, someone's gonna say, hey, don't bury the beater. Hey, play traditional grip. You play too loud, you play too fast, you play too slow, you're you're too much in the pocket, your your ride cymbal sucks. So like everybody has a certain <laughs> opinion, but if you you know, so if you just sit there and you're like, ooh, I'm gonna take all of this in and I'm gonna learn about what everybody has to say because everybody's points are valid. Different things mean mm -hmm. there's a different level of importance of things to different people. And then I will just find what works best for me. And then I can then I can absorb everything. But if I if I'm keeping like this wall, oh this is un unattainable, or I'm not good enough, or I don't like it, then you're then you're kind of like just like pushing yourself away from what you want. So that kind it's just for me it's been like looking at things very objectively with without any judgment. That's super cool, and I totally agree. Like I think a good taste in music doesn't mean that you know what you like already. It's being open to what you're hearing and accepting it for what it is and not for what it isn't. And I totally. think it's so cool that as a musician, you've embodied that because I think oftentimes, even as musicians, we get into, well, I'm a rock musician or, or a jazz musician, or whatever, and my music is the best. And then we judge other people's music. And then the musicians in those groups of music judge our group of music because we're judging them. And it's just right. this cycle of not honoring what's cool about each other's style of music and I think that carries over to just the everyday listener too who doesn't want to listen to jazz because jazz musicians act like the music that they like isn't very good yeah 100 percent and um even like this whole thing of clapping on the two and the four mm -hmm. and this people who wear t-shirts like hey don't clap on the one and the three and all that stuff but like when you're playing Indian music like you have to clap on the one and the three because there are so many offbeats. And like, so when I see people like making these strong judgments about things, I'm like, I respect you and what's important to you, but like, how dare you say that if you clap on the one and the three, you're wrong. And that means like, you're you're pushing away a whole culture. So it's like so much more mm -hmm. deeper that you're judging people's live livelihoods of playing a genre for centuries. Yeah. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it goes much deeper than just, I like this or I don't. To me, it just goes, into the level of respect for people and the hours and the work that they've put in to bring music to where it is today. Yeah, for sure. And isn't it so cool that music is like this, or just art in general, honestly, is this way to understand where a person and the community that they come from, like what's beautiful 
about them and what they have to offer. And if you like put down all of rap music because some of the lyrics make you uncomfortable, there's like this entire community of expression that you are undervaluing and putting down. And even if it's uncomfortable at first, I think art is this tool for you to gain empathy and compassion and understanding for people in such a real way. Yeah. And it's like, even like analyzing, doing like self-analysis, why does it make me uncomfortable? Maybe there are things that have been told to me by my surroundings and that has been wired into my brain that now there's this like automatic response that I feel uncomfortable. Cause like Mm -hmm. really, you know, why do certain people like certain foods? Now this is like my opinion. So for example, like I love Indian food. I've been Indian eating Indian food since I was like a little baby. And I remember my sweet mate in university, he had Indian food for the first time. And he was like in the washroom for like three hours. He's like, Sarah, <laughs> I'm never eating Indian food again. This sucks. Well, I'm like, yeah, because you've been eating like KFC and burgers and stuff all your, like that's been your diet. So of course this is going to be difficult. And to, okay, another an example is like, I used to have a very bad grass allergy to the point I couldn't breathe and it was horrible. So to treat it, I would get like a little shot of grass inside me every single week for about a year. And now I'm like, oh, is there grass around me? I didn't even notice. Yeah. So I say this to say, like when I was making that transition from self-taught land, Indian music, percussion based approach onto the drum kit. And I was, when I was making this transition to heavy duty drum nerd jazz and crazy stuff, for me, it was hard for me to resonate with a lot of the drum techniques and this new genres. It was really difficult for me to feel the same way that I felt when I was listening to Indian music, but I treated it the same way. I had to reprogram my brain. All I had to do is every day, listen to a little bit more and I had to go to clubs and stay up late and hear people's stories of why is the right symbol played like that important to you? Why is the clave important to you? And then once you like rewire your brain, then you'll fall in love with it. Cause it, it's, I think it's just repetition over a long period of time, whatever you want to like, not like, or do. Mm. That's I so think. cool. Yeah, no, even stuff that's like good for you is can feel wrong at first, you know, like 100%. the more I do yoga, I'll find things where like, this is uncomfortable, but this is actually like really good for my body to do. I'm just not used to doing this because I'm used to being in a position that's like not good for my body. Totally. Like even like meditation, like I started meditating right when the pandemic hit and the first day I was like so agitated. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Like, I just want to get up and go run around, you know, <laughs> you know, it's good for you. Yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. And one thing you said was really hit me was reflecting on why you don't like it or why you do like it. And I think reflection is an important part of experience that has been somewhat lost in an age where like even just a few decades back when you experienced something, a form of art, it was kind of hard to find those. So then you had a long period of kind of forced reflection because there just wasn't other stimuli. Now on something like TikTok, it's a bottomless like you there's there's no built-in time for reflection and to kind of sit with what the content you're consuming like is that good or bad do I enjoy it do I want to embody that in how I live my life and I think it's super important and I'm curious in how you structure your practice and you do a lot of listening time do you set aside time for like reflection in how you go about learning and listening to music So for me, I find anytime I try to plan my day, like if I tell myself that I'm going to spend an hour writing or an hour listening, it doesn't end up working out for me. I start getting Mm -hmm. very edgy. So I feel like for me, it has to come from a place of wanting to do it. And, but I, I tell myself that this is important to me and I want to do it every day over a long period of time. So for me, it's like, I have to do it at some point during the day like if I have a busy day if I have like a gig or whatever then I'll have to really pre-plan the time but ideally I like to listen to one album a day you know if I'm washing the dishes or like doing my chores and if I'm doing like uh uh things that don't need a lot of like brain work like if I'm like folding my blankets or doing my laundry I'll be thinking of things 
And that's when my reflection is happening. And I just feel like now it kind of just happens automatically without like setting time to do it, I would say. Yeah. No, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, a habit you've built. Yeah. I have several questions on social media. Yeah. It's easy for someone like myself who like doesn't have a huge following yet to yeah. make a lot of judgments about the impacts that it has on people and what it's doing just mm -hmm. from like a gut perspective, you know, but I'm curious. Well, first off, like, what do you think the point of social media is? Like, why is it valuable to you? It is so valuable to me because so when I was like in my mid teens in 2009 was when I posted my first YouTube video and my goal back then in my teens was to get into the Bollywood industry. That was my goal. And I started getting recognized from people and like big musicians and composers from Bollywood. And I started getting invited to go to India. And my mom told me, you're crazy. She's like, you are not going anywhere until you get your degree in music. And she's like, you get your degree in music, then you can do and go wherever you want. So I'm like, all right. Um, so I was in school, in high school. I'm like, I'm just going to keep trying to get recognized. So when I leave school, I'll have things that are, that I have options for. And the thing about Canada is Canada has so much talent. Like Canada's music scene is like unbelievable, but I feel like we are our own entity. So to get recognized in LA or like in New York, like amongst all my heroes without being there, what can I do? And social media allowed me to do that. It allowed me to show who I am. And that was my goal. My goal was, how can I show you my personality, my playing, my style, my versatility? How could I show that to you um, without being in front of you? So I was like, mm -hmm. so that's been my mentality for like over 10 years. And it's helped me branch out into so many places and to get recognized by my heroes who don't even live here. Yeah. No, that's cool. I think it sounds like you treat social media as more of like a springboard than a destination. 100%, 100%. Like it's literally just a tool for me to get from point A to point B. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like there are, well, I'll backtrack. I think for me, one of the most meaningful parts of playing music has been my connection to the lineage and getting to know mentors and being in the community. And I think that's something that is lost when you are just trying to become Instagram famous and like jump to the front of the line. Not that it doesn't mean you don't have merit as a musician, but I just know from personal experience that the connections with other people are like the only thing that has mattered really. And if, yeah you kind of skyrocket past all of that, I have to imagine like there will be some sense of longing just for that kind of connection because I guess I'll ask, has having more followers or growing your platform, whatever changed your relationship with it? Like, does it feel, does it feel any different now or is it the same kind of weird surrogate for connection? I would say the more of the following that I've gotten in the last couple of years has changed and that's helped me connect with so many different types of people, I would mm -hmm. say that I, and um, being able to share and um, have different experiences with other people. Like if I go, I, when I went to play in Spain or if I go to like a different part of the world, people will say, Hey, we were inspired by what you do. Hey, we recognize you. We love what you do. So I'm like, wow, like I've made some sort of impact in somebody else's life. You know, and especially for me, like I'm trying to go down the artist road and trying to write a lot of music and trying to blend the mainstream with the with the jazz and whatever. So I feel like for me personally, I want to grow some sort of fan base and I want to do it under my control and how I want to do it. Yeah. You know, I never want to rely on anybody to tell me what to do. You know, so ex for example, my dad, the reason why he didn't want me to be a drummer, because 
he hired a lot of drummers because he was a band leader. And he's like, back then, nobody cared about the drummer. The drummer would arrive first. The drummer would be last. They were at the back of the stage. Like, he's like, why do you want to do this to yourself? And he's like, you're a woman on top of that. He's like, you're going to be roaming the streets late at night. He's like, I'm telling you, Sarah, just become a singer and your life is going to be complete. So that's what he did. He put me in singing lessons for 15 years, like Indian classical singing lessons. And I hated it so much. But anyway, <laughs> um, so then he told me, fine. He's like, if you want to do this whole drumming thing, he's like, then make yourself as a drummer artist. Like hmm. never be at the mercy of somebody hiring you. Make yourself very hireable that everybody will want you so you can be in the driver's seat. So that's how I take like social media. Yeah. Yeah. Is you, well, and that's cool. And it can be hard to do to not be beholden to the platform and the algorithm or whatever you want to call it, like playing the game instead of just using it to like try to be yourself. And that's one thing I have been thinking about is that I do see a general longing of people for content creators to be more authentic on social media. And I certainly feel like you do a great job of that, of just trying to be yourself. But I also have this kind of like voice in the back of my head that's like, I'm not sure if you really can be yourself like 100% on social media, just because of how these platforms are set up, like it's a pretty specific lens you have to mold yourself through. And if I've learned anything trying to do remote music, it's that you lose stuff once it goes through the device. And maybe I just kind of worry that if we all are like, oh, well now we're using social media, but we're being authentic about it we continue building up this idea that like social media is your destination point, you know, because it's like, Oh, now these are authentic people I'm connecting with on there. But yeah. as you were saying, like you've used social media to connect with all these people. And I think content creators look at social media differently than the end user. And it would be really cool to remind the end user that it also shouldn't be like a destination point for you either. Like this is me yeah. just telling you, this is how I can tell you I have a show that's real and in person and you can be there and we can connect exactly. and become friends. Right. So yeah. how do you use social media to like, or like, how do you view being authentic on, on these apps? So I want to first address the something that you said in which I agree with that there's okay. so many different types of people on social media, that there's the content creators or there is, you know, there's the people who find social media as their destination. So I think about it like this, like I have a twin sister. My sister is a pharmacist and all the people that graduated with her, some of them are not good at what they do. Some of them are amazing at what they do, but they all graduated with the same degree and they all are permitted to do and fulfill the same job. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's like people on Instagram. Some people will be our musicians who are amazing and, and they will post and they and their content will do great. Or there are some people who 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 just love the social media life and they will be content creators and their music will be good. So I just feel like it's just we have to accept that like it's all it's gonna it's gonna fluctuate and that we can just control like what we want our destination to be. Cause I, I like I know some people they just they want to like have the most followers. And I'm like, if that's the way you want to live your life, I can't tell you how to live it. And as long as you're happy and being the happiest version of yourself, I'm happy with that. So that's like kind of how I wrap my mind around it. Um, and then the next thing about being authentic. So I think before, like a year ago, before the pandemic, I was always, I have to post my best drum solo that I did at a gig. I have to show like the best version of myself. And, and during the pandemic, I'm like, why? Like, who cares? <laughs> nobody cares. You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody cares about me. Like, nobody pays my bills. I'm just, I'm just going to do whatever I want. So, yeah. like, for example, what I've been doing as of late is that, like, when, when I was a kid, I used to love, like, hosting shows and, like, talking in the mic. So I've been, like, taking, just saying a bunch of garbage in the mic and, like, playing drum solos around and just, like, having the time of my life and doing, like, It's these... really cool. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, I'm glad. It's like some of these things don't make sense, but I'm trying. Yeah, it's this whole blending between like the comedy and like the virtuosity. So it's doing it's doing good, like a lot of views and whatever. But then I did this one where I took uh, the Tears for Fears, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. 
and uh-huh. I, I, I purposely, no, I didn't sing. Like I just like talked. It was off pitch. I know, like I, I ruined the song. That day I posted it, I lost 500 followers. Wow. Yeah. Because I was like full on blast being, and people commented, we think she's on drugs. Uh, We think she's (laughs) mental. People are like, she's ruined. Like the the video, for example, on my Facebook page, it got 800,000 views on my Facebook page. And then on Instagram, it got like 25, 26,000 likes. So it's just like, it got a lot of publicity and like three quarters was, no, I would say like 60% was positive and 40% was negative. So yeah, like I lost 500 followers in a day and I called my sister. I'm like, am I making a mistake by like doing this stuff? She's like, no, Sarah. She's like, trust your gut. So then Mm. I just kept rolling with it. I'm like, if you don't like it, cool. If you like it even better. And then my fault, then a couple of days later, like I got like 2000 followers back. So like it canceled it out anyway. But the point that I'm making is that in that moment, if I saw 500 followers gone and I deleted the video, that means I'm making content uh, because of other people and getting their approval. That means I don't trust myself. That means I don't have confidence in myself. So like, that's been my mindset. Like I trust myself. I have enough faith that I'll do what I want to do because this is my life. If you don't like it, great. If you like it, great. So I don't cater to the algorithm much. I just try to, do whatever the, the hell I want to do. Like, that's how I think about it. Mm-hmm. No, that's cool. And I, I remember the video you're talking about. And yeah. it was, like, jarring because I don't think you had gone that far into just, I'm going to be my weird, bad self, you know? Yeah. Um, that's cool. And I think there's something to be said that, like, if those, the 500 followers you lost or whatever, like, probably weren't going to come to your show, you know? Yeah. If, whether or not they had seen that or not. Yeah. The biggest worry that I had was, am I thought I'm ruining my career. Like I thought <laughs> if this is happening, am I, uh, am I stupid? Like, is my career over after this point? And like, I had to talk to my sister. I needed to like get some validation from my parents. Like they're like, Sarah, you do what your heart tells you to do. And I even remember, like I, I, I had a mentor who didn't like it. And she told me, she's like, Sarah, you want to show the best representation of yourself online. She's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, you know what, if you're going to tell me that I can't post things like this, and if this makes me happy, and if this is what I want to do, I'm going to keep doing it, even if I lose a 1000 followers, and even if my career is over. Mm. So then like, that's yeah. then, then that gave me the confidence to run with it. You know? Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. And yeah. it seems like people are resonating with it. And you're also like getting better at it. Like the, the videos that you're doing in that vein of expression are just yeah. becoming more clear. I love like Reggie Watts. I love Mar- what's his name? Mark Mark Ribele. Yeah. Ribele, yeah, Ribele. I don't oh, know. My- his, I don't hear talking. His- yeah, like he's so funny and he's so cool. It's it's yeah, it's just having a it's having a good time, you know. Mhm. Yeah, that's super cool. I in one interview of yours, I heard that you think about success as just how happy you are. And I have been thinking about happiness lately as just a measurement of how much I'm growing. And you're like a super dedicated worker. I know that, but I'm curious what your relationship with growth is and like how important is that to you and what areas in your life do you look for that? Yeah. Um, so in terms of happiness and success, I too, like, I measure success in terms of heading towards the direction that I want um, and not like quantifying how much I'm growing. And just Mm -hmm. for me, it's like, maybe for me, it's not much so the growth, but it's like making an effort towards growing every single day, whether it's like, yeah, rather. So there's no expectation. Did I grow? Oh, I didn't. Okay. So I'm a failure rather than I planted the seed today. I'm grateful. And for Mm -hmm. me, like, that's in my relationship, like in my personal relationship with my fiance, that's with my, my family, my twin sister, my parents, with my grandparents, um, with the music that I'm writing, with the person that I am, with my spiritual life, uh, with the relationships around me, with my music. Um, so I would say in like every aspect of my life, I would say. That's cool. And I, yeah. I like that way of looking at it. Yeah. And it's, I guess it's this thing of, for me, growth is like this very intense feeling this like knowing optimism that 
if I apply myself to things, like I do have the power to change things because I know it in my own experience. That's one of the most powerful lessons I think we learn as musicians is like something you have no capability of doing. You can learn how to do that and get really good at it and have that ability impact other people. And why does it have to stop at music? You can do it in all these things. And that just excitement of like, what else can I change? To me, like, to me, that's happiness is like hope that the world can be better and that I can help make that happen. And I don't think that, I kind of think that feeling doesn't really matter like how much you were growing. I think it's consistent in any level of growth as long as you acknowledge that growth that it's happening and you celebrate it, you can you can tap into that in any way. Yeah, and along with growth, I would say working on awareness. So like, you know, I have a couple of friends who I was talking to as of late and um, we were talking, like for example, one of my friends, she's like, yeah, I wanna go to law school one day. And it's like, okay, but to go to, being her friend, I'm gonna be straight up honest with her. I'm like, okay, if you're gonna go to law school, it's gonna take this amount of years. Then do you know you're gonna be this age by the time you finish? She's like, oh my God, I didn't think about that. Then I'm like, okay, then what kind of law? What you, Like, what do you wanna do? Or even with some of my music friends, like I just wanna be a singer. Okay, and like, I just wanna be a drummer, but but what? Like there's so many like, you know, awareness of the possibilities that are out there the awareness of what it takes to get there rather than just yeah yeah i'm just gonna i'm gonna do it but then not understanding what it takes to get there and then at then later in life you end up disappointed Mm -hmm. that like oh then you have the regrets that oh i didn't grow enough or i didn't do what i had to do and i wish i would have i could have i should and so to avoid all that uh, making an effort to grow every day and increase the awareness and educating yourself around like around you what you need to do to get to where you want to be and maybe being very clear and but then being open that it can change but being mm-hmm. being just being awareness I would say is huge for me being aware yeah, yeah. totally yeah that's so true like if I'm thinking I want to have a career like Sarah's oftentimes that just looks like well I want these opportunities and to play with these people and to sound this good and to have like this much of a following kind of thing but all the stuff that isn't included in my mental picture i'm trying to manifest or whatever is the clearer picture which is i'm only seeing the highlight big picture moments that get shared on the headline right oh my god all the other stuff is like how much work you put in how much time you're on the road all these different stresses and things and if you were talking to a musician who like wanted to like, let's say like, I want the career that you have. What are the parts of it that I might not be seeing that I should be aware of going into it, you know, and, and decide if I want that or not and how to like start doing those things because that's part of the process that I can create. Yeah. So I'll, I'll list a few things. So the first thing that I would say is, failing like a ton like I failed so much and I'd (laughs) cry in my room like for hours and hours and I would and I would feel like such a failure to the point where I'm like I'm done with music like that's how rock bottom I was um so I'll give an example there's a video of me on YouTube um I played at the Ralph Angelilo drum festival in Quebec and this was 2017 or something and it's good quality audio, good quality video. And it was posted by Vic Firth. And they asked me, they're like, do you want me to post it? And I'm like, yeah, okay, post it. My friends were like, if you post, if they post this video, your career is over because I'm speeding up and slowing down. Cause it was my first drum festival and I was so nervous. And mm-hmm. then in the drum solo section, I lost time. Yeah. That'll I did it. a metric. <laughs> oh, I did a metric modulation and I was so hyper that when I came back on the one, I came back too fast Mm -hmm. and then, and then like, Oh my God, it was like one of the most, and then another embarrassing moment played at the Miami jazz festival with um, a Cuban jazz band drum solo. And it was just the clave. The percussionist was playing the clave and it was me. And I was so nervous. I lost the clave. I couldn't hear the clave and my drum solo was horrible. And Paquito de Rivera was, I think their whole band was watching us from the side stage. So literally after we played, I just ran at the back of the audience and I just started crying, you know? Oh, no. So it's yeah. like, it's like things like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's, 
literally that's the tip of the iceberg it was like that's mm. all i want to say and even like for me like after during university or after university every single night i was out until four in the morning every single night hitting all the clubs going to all the jam sessions sitting in watching asking questions because a lot of people are like sarah like a lot of people outside of canada before were like you just popped out of nowhere how did you just blow up i'm like just blow up i'm like you you know like like gigging like six days a week and like staying up till four in the morning and, and another example so when i was on tour two years ago i toured with this guy named watsky george watsky hip-hop artist and his music is amazing because there's not a lot of tracks so the drummer has to play a lot and i had to yeah I had to play a lot and i got a drum solo every night and it was the coolest experience of my life and everyone the audience would go go sarah go sarah go and i'd do like a big drum solo <laughs> it was fun but to get to the point um it was my first two month tour we did 42 shows and before every show i would take an uber to the guitar center practice two hours a day and then go do the gig for two months that's what i did so it's like it's like that constant hustle 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 i would say yeah yeah dang um honestly yeah it's <laughs> oh yeah one other thing sorry sorry yes, to cut please. you off before no, i forget good. yeah even like for example in university so like i've been with my fiance we've been together for like nine years and i met him when i was in university and i told him listen i drums is my career and i want it to be my life so what we would do is he understood how much practicing meant to me so i'd be practicing in my dorm room and i would give him my vic firth soundproof headphones and he would sit there in the corner do his homework and i'd be practicing for hours hmm. i never went to any parties in college no parties everyday practice um, like I sacrificed my social life for a really long time and like missed a lot of family things, vacations or whatever, because I was so obsessed that I'm like, if I'm not, I have to sound at least 75% of how I want to before I can enjoy life again. I was really hard. I, like, I think I went too extreme because I wanted it so bad, but mm -hmm. that, that was really my mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it was worth it? Like if you if you could change it, I mean, obviously you can't, but like, would you have practiced a little less looking back and spent more time on yourself or it was worth it to you? It was, I would do it in a heartbeat all over again. Totally. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now I, it's always fun to hear like when Walter, um, who connected us was on here, talked about him like embarrassing himself, himself and other people. And I even like got my, the first email from you and then there was like a day where we didn't lock it down. And I, for whatever reason, just got super nervous that like, oh, like this isn't going to happen. And then I like had just this little idea and just did it in the moment. And then I got so nervous, but I, I had been following you for like a long time on Instagram. And I was like, well, if I like unfollow her and follow her again, she'll see my name oh. and it'll like remind her. And then I did that and I was like, wait, now she'll think I wasn't following her until now. And that I'm just like using her. And I got so nervous like That's so cute. about the whole thing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it, it gets the best of us. Like I, I do that all the time too and go down that downward spiral. That's horrible. Yeah. yeah Cause there's all these like networking rules or things of like, what, it, what's the protocol for connecting with people on social media, you know, like, like, and you see advertisements for like courses to go through to learn how these do these things. And it's always nice to remember that it's like everyone is really confused about how to, to use this. You know what? It's like for me personally, like I've been told so many opinions of that things wouldn't work out or what am I doing? All these things. Now I'm just like, I don't care. Like if I want to do it, I'm just going to do it. Even if it's like against the rules or even because some of my heroes have told me, I know people, some people don't like my playing. Some people like my playing and there's all these different opinions. So now it's just like, I'll unfollow, I'll follow. I'll do what I want. People can think what they want because I'm just like doing me. And it's like, once you really try and embody that and I'm still working on that, really trying to embody that, it's a very liberating feeling. And I feel like with that liberating feeling, music just even becomes, it gets to, to a more spiritual place rather than more of an egotistic place or coming from that space. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Before we're done, are there any like thoughts that you have or things that you want to share just about your journey with wellness and happiness and enjoying the process? Anything that comes to mind? Um, I think one thing that comes to my mind is that everybody's different. 
And you know, sometimes we see success as, hey, the most likes, hey, the most views, hey, the best tour or the best drum solo or whatever. But it really isn't like that because everybody is special. Everybody has a gift. Everything is meant different for different people. So like not to compare one success to the next person because there was this picture that I saw that really touched me that there was this one like animal a cartoon that like picked up the carrot from the ground and he's like hey I have the carrot I won and there was like another animal that was a cartoon that the carrot like it was under the ground and he couldn't see that he was about to pull it off but he walked the other way mm. so the point of that was that if you like envy other people or compare your success to other people you won't even be able to know what your success is and what's there for you yeah so that's my words of encouragement that's awesome well yeah, thank you so much for all this for sharing it's so fun to meet you and get to talk and if you'd mm -hmm. like before we're done if you have anything coming up things that you want people to know about you're welcome to let them know yeah well i have some merch coming out Ooh. in the next two weeks and it's like it's really out there you know like my, i showed it to my family and they're like sarah who's gonna wear this but i'm like i don't care i think it's pretty cool so i would just say stay tuned for that <laughs> yes okay awesome yeah yeah well yeah. thank you this was fantastic yeah. my absolute pleasure i had fun talking to you and hope to do it again sometime and hope hope to meet you in the future <laughs>